So before I get started, I will warn everyone that due to the nature of the topic and the example I'm using, I will be covering graphic content. I found my best to avoid the worst of it, but I've been sensitized to this after studying it for the last three years. So discretion is advised. So this, this is a uh, video is an NTSB uh, recreation of a particular event. The last the last lines that were that were said by the pilots were, we're not going to make it. We're going to be in the Hudson. Does anyone recognize that? So for those of you who don't, that was the final radio message from United Airways flight 1549. A minute later, the Airbus A320 landed in the Hudson River. Only minor injuries occurred, and this incident has since become known as the miracle on the Hudson. It's one of the most famous bird strike incidents to date, and it attributes to a significant rise in incident reporting and safety requirements. But it's not the only bird strike incident that's occurred in the U.S. Between 1990 and 2019, about approximately 230,000 bird strike incidents were reported. The FAA records the National Wildlife Strike Database. I'll use one of these reports to I'll use one of these reported incidents to discuss major problems that occur that bird strikes can cause to air, airborne vehicles, especially smaller vehicles. So let me first introduce you to the incident. There it is. On April 20th, on April 20th, 2016, a Cessna 172 conducted photographic survey flights near Birchwood Airport in Chugaya, Alaska. On board was the pilot and three passengers. The aircraft passed over the airport towards the survey region before banking sharply to the right and disappearing from radar. Further investigations revealed crush damage to the left horizontal tail and the remains of a juvenile bald eagle. According to later reports, given this evidence, it is likely that the airplane impacted one or more eagles in flight and that the pilot subsequently lost airplane control. Now, how could the bear vehicle lose control, you might ask? Now, well, from an aerodynamics perspective, the loss of control is to be expected. So let's look at the 2D aerodynamic principles before diving into 3D principles. You have four basic forces, thrust, lift, drag, and weight. Lift and drag are gonna be the more important pieces here. The air flowing around a 2D airfoil has two different types of flow. It can be smooth laminar flow or irregular turbulent flow. When, where these flow types meet is referred to as the boundary layer, which are these dashed lines. So when air flows around, around the wing and moves faster over the top of the wing rather than the bottom of the wing, this difference in speed causes a higher, causes lower pressure regions to develop over the top of the wing. Air, of course, wants to move from high pressure regions to low pressure regions. So this movement is, going to, is what causes the upwards lifting force. Now these same aerodynamic principles, can, these same air flows can cause drag as well. And there's two particular there's two particular sources that are that are key here. The first and easiest to predict is drag resulting from a stall. This is when the boundary layer of air separates from the. This is when the boundary layer of air separates from the airfoil, and uh, yeah, the angle of attack where this where this occurs at is known as the stall angle. In other words, the laminar flow has completely separate. Yeah, it's no longer attached to the lift generating surfaces and is instead replaced by drag producing turbulent flow. The second can be trickier to predict. This anything that protrudes from the airfoil surface, be it as insignificant as a bolt or bird feet, can cause disturbances in the airflow that produce turbulent flow. Now to the fun part. 3D aerodynamics. Personally, anything that passes through the air can generate lift and drag, including an aircraft's body and tail. Now, the lift provided by the tail is actually critical in the aircraft's stability. It counteracts the torque that's produced in the wings and stabilizes the vehicle. Furthermore, and we'll see another example of this later, but if you were to take the amount of lift and drag produced at each point, at select points across the wing, and plot them on a graph 
based on where they're located, will produce what are known as lift and lift and the will produce what's known as lift and drag distribution west. Any irregular disruptions in that distribution can change the vehicle's handling. That's actually the basic principle of how control services work. They make slight controlled changes in the vehicle's airflow to produce a controlled motion. Now, damage components can also cause this kind of effect. So, aircraft are required to be able to withstand certain kinds of impacts. For example, a transport aircraft must be able to safely operate after colliding with a four pound bird while flying at top speed at sea level. Note that I said transport aircraft. This same standard does not apply to a general aviation aircraft like Cessna 172. So they're less resistant to impact damages. This results in significant impact damages. Especially when your impact is approximately equivalent to two thirty-five-thousand pound semis colliding head-on, each traveling about fifty-eight point five miles an hour. So, vehicle was damaged in the collision, but what kind of handling effects did it have? Well, to determine this, I used two different aircraft design and aerodynamic analysis programs: Open Vehicle Sketch Pad or Open VSP and XFLR5. These are models that I've used for my open VSP analysis. The one on the left is the base model that I found online. The one on the right is one that I had modified to reflect the approximate damage. Both programs have the capacity to estimate the aerodynamic performance of an aircraft. Now, these are the results from XFLR5's 2D aerodynamic analysis. The top airfoil is the normal airfoil at the damage location. The bottom airfoil approximates the damage. As you can see, the damaged airfoil has significant airflow separation. This decreased the lift on the damaged aircraft compared to normal operation and increased the drag compared to normal operation. And that single airflow caused the aircraft to pitch to the right and down. This can be seen on the radar track. I approximate that the, based on the radar track, I approximate that the strike would have occurred somewhere around here. You can see that it travels in sharp right direction before finally disappearing from radar. Now I'll offer one final warning of discretion. Following images may be disturbing. I will pause for a second if anyone wants to look away or leave the room. These are images of the wreckage. Top right image is a comparison between the Smithsonian bird feather lab specimen and sample feathers that were taken from the wreckage. The damage resulted in the vehicle downing in a post crash fire, which claimed the lives of the pilot and all three passengers. The vehicle was a little box. Now I'm going to switch to my image for a second. These are all images that my parents or I have taken. I do want to note for you guys that I track bird nests with Cornell Lab for ornithology. Please don't approach a nest without proper authorization or training as the services can seriously harm eggs, nests, chicks, the parents, etc. So, what's next? How do we prevent bird strikes? That's a multi-million dollar question right now with scientists and engineers working daily all over the world. As more and more planes take to the sky, we share more and more of our airspace with our feather friends. My personal theory to prevent air strikes and bird strikes is this. Aircraft, especially large aircraft, can prove difficult to maneuver quickly and avoid imminent threats. If we can locate or track birds, then have pilots maneuver away from them before they become an imminent threat. Avoiding them in the first place becomes more feasible. The bird strikes were not going to happen if I can be avoided in the first place. Now, for now, though, I'll continue my own research of analyzing the FAA's National Wildlife Threat Database to find as many patterns as possible. I aim to provide a better foundation and understanding of bird strike factors and as a base for my own future research. 
Eventually, it's my hope that we can reduce occurrences of bird strike disasters and tragedies from the downing of a Cessna 172 to near Columbia Hudson. Thank you. Thank you. I'd first like to give special thanks to Dr. Carla Dove from the Smithsonian Bird Feather Identification Lab and Drs. Richard Goldbeer and Phyllis Miller from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I had reached out to them to, to ask for support in making sure that I was depicting everything correctly and that I was understanding the data correctly. I'd also like to thank the National Transportation Safety Board for directing me to them, the Open DSP Technical Support Group for providing support when I was having problems with Open DSP. And for the Carolina Eagle Friends Facebook group for providing me with some of their photos of these mile ball eagles. Any questions? What current measures are they taking to prevent some of these accidents? Um, well, currently, most of it is management or wildlife management at the airport level. So you have people at the airport who specifically look for look for wildlife, chase them away, put measures in place to prevent them from coming back. If there's, say, habitat or a food source that would attract them, they mitigate that. And that's, right now that's about it, but there, there are a lot of different efforts in ways of, or there are a lot of different research efforts to produce bird strikes. I am not kidding when I say it's a multi-million dollar project. I have seen sources of funding that, that range like several million dollars in one place, and that's, that's barely scratching the surface of how much there is. What are some of those projects that they're working on? Do you know? Um, one of them, I think it's just you want to mention this, but you the using radar to detect. Yeah, actually, yeah, you just got a, a picture today. Yeah. From, uh, from one of the people that, uh, the Emily contacted. So the, um, uh, and I can't right now, but the, um, but we, we have a, we, I know that um, the Air Force had one from about 20 years ago that we started with um, that for, for the base and um, we've been working with, and Emily had a lot of conversations with the wildlife section today. So in terms of what, um, I actually have got a sense of need to be picking up that from the company that we've been talking about that yeah, I'll probably give you that myself too. But um, I know there's another one that the wildlife specialist mentioned. They're they're looking at using like Hoffman Prairie as a way to help mitigate to help mitigate bird strikes. I don't remember how I don't remember how or what it is, but I remember you mentioning something like that. Uh, okay, so let's say that you're a pilot flying flying a little bit now. Um, is there anything you need to do to like prevent dying? If you see him or if you see the bird, it's a big question because you can only see so far away. And by the time you see them and react, you have very little time. Like if you look at the transcript from the miracle on the Hudson, it was bird. So they were traveling at, I think it was 120 knots, something like that. Yeah, so they're, especially if you're flying with a larger aircraft, it is practically impossible to avoid them from sighting their case. In a Cessna, it is extremely difficult, but doable. Yeah. Yeah, and this is from the National Wildlife Research Center, um, Dr. Blackwell is saying that they're also looking at, I mean, what we talked about with um, Mr. Warren on base is that they were exploring different types of grasses the plant here, but um, in this in this study, they're actually looking at lighting. Um, and, you know, because, and there's simple things like if you understand, um, if you, is it different species like here, um, have a different attack rate than we do? So what looks like a steady light to us can look like a flashing light to other species. And you can use, and you can find, um, you can find ways of basically strobing um, add a vocabulary that will um, that will discourage um, certain wildlife from being there because you know a, a light being steady on and a light being steady off you, know, you can learn to manage with that but when it's flickering on and off that can be really 
Mm -hmm. Interesting approach to the problem. <laughs> Are the bigger planes as affected by these sorts of collisions? Like, is that a, how common is that? Like, I mean, how many um, accidents happen as a result, like crashes, let's say? Um, I don't know the exact percentage, but for larger aircraft, they actually had design requirements. Like, say you had birds hit the engine. For a larger aircraft, you had design requirements where you have to be able to continue, still be able to operate with even just on one engine. So it's depending on what it is that it hits. Yeah, it, it can cause a downing. With the Miracle on the Hudson, both of their engines are lost. So they, they just, they had, they were going down, no doubt about it. But for other aircraft, like if you just hit the windshield or if you hit the, if you hit one engine, you're probably not going to have much of a problem. You're going to have to get some maintenance done. Tail or the wing, well, the tail especially, that could cause more problems just because the tail is so key in keeping the aircraft stable. Yeah, well, I will say most of the injuries and fatalities that come from worst strikes are either coming from helicopters or from smaller, generally aviation aircraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, right now, we're probably killing more wildlife than they're killing us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's problematic in itself. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, well, I mean, the, the death of the, the wildlife that is, is, and one of the things that we're curious about, especially as we do some more things to drop, mm -hmm. is this idea that are they going to be safe with us, mm -hmm. right? And we feel, and, and this, is a, this is an idea that Emily up with, which I thought was brilliant, is this idea if you can demonstrate the drone can coexist safely with birds, then you can feel better about them living coexisting safely. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, you know, so like, you know, with cars, if, if a, um, if an autonomous car um, has less problems with road kill mm -hmm. in general, then I think you should also safer hanging around that car. Right, mm -hmm. because if it's able to account for life, other forms of life around it, then you know it's it's, it's better for everybody. So I think this this type of study I think is going to become more and more important as we work with more and more on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, another interesting point, kind of tip, tangenting off of that, uh, I was actually having a discussion with Dr. Dove earlier this week about uh, passenger pigeons. So passenger pigeons are like a small pigeon that used to exist in the billions way back before Europeans ever arrived in the Americas. They went extinct back in the 1910s. Last passenger pigeon known died in 1914 at the Cincinnati Zoo. And scientists have actually been working to bring them back. So I shared with Dr. Dove and, or with Dr. Dove, Dr. Goldbeer, and uh, Dr. Miller, a paper that I had written for in my previous classes, detailing like, if this were successful, what kind of threat could it pose to aircraft? This, I mean, I don't even remember how this thought experiment, I guess you would call it, started, but it was basically like, if an aircraft already has problems trying to survive just one hawk or something, how are they going to survive practical bombardment of a flock of maybe thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of birds, if we're looking at the same numbers that they were at before. Like if I don't see an aircraft surviving that. And I know she Dr. Dove had also mentioned that that was something that she also spent a lot of time thinking about. Yeah, I think yeah. I think as we're as we're looking at those problems, like we need to be we also need to be looking at how will this affect how we're living right now? Do we need to change with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those were actually very well adapted to the climate, and they were numerous. Oh, and, yeah. You know, it, it's an interesting story, even how they were eliminated. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. people, before they realized, oh, shoot, they really are extinct, they all thought they were just flying to Greenland. But no, if we, a species from billions of, or, a species that numbered in the billions when it went from inexhaustible to extinct in 50 years. Yeah. That was actually the 
That's also part of the reason why the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the Lacey Act were founded. Lacey actually doesn't do as much, but the, I mean, Lacey is kind of important, but it's really the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that protects most of our wildlife. So it's most of our native birds. Okay, most of the time. Any other questions? Thanks.